Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Michael Riedel, the theater columnist of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. One of the wonderful successes of the new theater season is a revival of Martin McDonough's Cripple of Inishman. It was directed by Gary Hines, who's here with us today, and it stars Marie Mullen. Gary and Marie founded the Druid Theater Company together and together came to New York and won Tony Awards for the Beauty Queen of Lanann. Welcome back. Thank to you theater very talk. much. Gary very nice to be here. Talk, yes, uh, yeah, we haven't seen you guys uh, in a while. I remember we interviewed you, Gary, uh, right after you won the Tony Award for Beauty Queen of Lanann. Did you? I can't remember very much about that. I was just there. Everything was a bit a of a blur. Yeah. I, I really didn't expect to, want, to win. And uh, so then when I did, I was really stunned. So most of the evening I actually spent stunned. It was only the following morning that I thought to myself, my God, I've won the Tony. It was a wonderful uh, production. Time. And yeah, we have to say, you. you were the first woman to win a Direction uh, Tony Award. I was, but it's possible. a bit like they talk about Irish buses, you know what I mean? You wait for one and then two come along at the same time. Well, yeah, that's right. You uh, win Julie Taymor. Yeah, Julie Taymor won one, I think something like about 10 minutes after me. That's right. She yeah. won for the Lion King. But that's quite yeah, something. The Lion that, King, yeah. that there was that distinction. How many years ago was that? Uh, 11, right? 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 or 11, something like that. Yeah, you and, and now. It's gotten much better for women in the theater. Absolutely, but I remember at the time, um, you know, when we were nominated and people began to talk about the fact to say that no woman had ever won for direction yes. of a play, or direction at all, and uh, I, I thought that couldn't be. I mean, the Tony Awards are what more than fifty years old, and you know, women have made such a great contribution uh, in terms of lighting, design, direction, and so on. But of course, acting you have too. To, well, well, <laughs> obviously for acting, yeah. but you know, there've been plenty of Tonys for acting. Sure, sure. Yes, because it's uh, a gender-based uh, category. Uh, gender, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think the thing is that you make the mistake, of course, of thinking the Tony Awards are, are awards for American theatre generally. They're not. They're for shows that happen on Broadway, which yeah, is that's not quite the same. You, you and, uh, Marie, you and Gary started the Druid Theatre Company together in Ireland. What, was it a, a, a struggle for women at that point? Well, I think it was. It was, was unusual. I mean, we all, in, we, we met in college and we all knew about Gary's energy and Gary's, uh, Gary's interest and love of the theatre even then, when we were still students. So I, I think that was unusual at the time. Where was the college? Uh, the university in Galway, yeah. University College Galway, and uh, we had often we we did a production there. We had often talked about the possibility of um, making a career out of the business at that time, but nothing very. We we had exams and we were going going to see what sort of further studies we'd do, and it was nothing very serious. And then uh, then the the summer came, and we decided we'd we'd make an make an attempt to. Uh, set up a summer season with three plays, and uh, it went from there. And off this you was went. 1975, right? So it's, it's been 1975. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, we didn't have had any idea. I mean, it, it took me a few years to realize, five or six years actually directing professionally, so to speak, before I realized it was actually unusual to have women directors. Mm. Hmm. And and it's the same thing. We wanted we wanted to sort of go on. You know, making theatre, and but the notion of trying to become a professional seemed incredibly remote to us. So we thought, well, why not found our own company? And at the age of twenty twenty one, you can do that. You know? right. <laughs> not afraid of anything. It's not yeah, afraid of anything. Why, why? You know, everybody says, "Well, you were very brave." Not at all. It was bravery didn't come into it at all. Yeah. It was great fun. Yeah, right. Yes. Well, I mean, that's that is the lesson, though. I think to be in the theatre, I, I, if you meet a lot of young people, they say, "How do I get started? How do I get in? How do I get there?" And I suppose the best advice, though, is to say, you know, just do a play. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it is. And I think the thing is, uh, I had worked here as a student while I was in college. I worked here in New York as a student, and uh, I I saw all the great stuff off off Broadway. And it was that experience, rather than any experience of Irish theatre, that thought me to think, oh, look, you, you can make theatre in small rooms. You don't need big stages or anything like that. Oh, and that was very much part of the driving 
thinking behind fi founding Druid. And you were also Sorry. inspired by writers at that time as well, yeah. by, by the theatre and how people were approaching the theatre in America because Absolutely. she used to come home and, uh, you know, some of us didn't go to America for summers. <laughs> <laughs> and she would bring all these wonderful plays back. And we Who were the playwrights then? David Rabe, mm. uh, Paul, Foster, uh, Paul Foster. John Ware. Paul Foster, how wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Paul Foster, well, I'm just John very sad to see uh, Tom O'Horgan pass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all that was. So that's interesting now because we've had a great. We, we benefited in New York from this wonderful wave of Irish writing in the last few years. Martin McDonough, certainly, uh, the wonderful Connor McPherson, Isn't, who writes yeah. beautiful plays. Um, so it's sort of interesting. What you're saying at the time you founded the Druid was, what was the state of Irish writing then? You, did you not have a lot of young writers, or were you, you know, were sort of wedded no. to the classics? Well, you had master writers. You had Freel, well, Freel was there, right. and you had Tom Murphy. But these, these were established writers in the professional theatre, to which to people like myself and Murray on the, at the University in the West Coast of Ireland with, with no professional theatre whatsoever in our background, that was just very, very remote. The, even the idea of sort of, we did one of Brian Freel's plays, but he, you know, so the, it, it was, the early years of Druid were, in fact, you know, Druid was kind of driven by the ideas of the theatre that I saw in New York. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the repertoire in the early years was that. It was only gradually, in over a period of two, three years, that we began, in fact, to develop um, uh, Irish, new Irish writing and doing Irish writing. Mm -hmm. And really, it was when uh, Tom Murphy, in fact, became mm -hmm. writer in association with the company in the early 80s that we began to actually concentrate on Irish right. work. Now, why did Martin McDonough come into your lives? He came in and I um, have been artistic director of the Abbey mm -hmm. uh, for three years and um, had never attended to return to Druid, but did in, was asked back um, and did in 1995, I think. And I simply asked to see what plays had been coming across. And these were unsolicited manuscripts, these were unsolicited right? Manuscripts. I mean, no one knew who Martin was then. I had no idea. Mm. And I remember reading one and coming downstairs and saying, Who is this guy? Nobody knew except that he had a, an address in London. And I said, Has he sent anything else in? And he had, and I read that as well. Immediately arranged to meet him. Uh, found that he'd been turned down by a number of other uh, companies. Uh, met him in London and optioned uh, all three of the plays, which my board sort of, you know, this was just a few months after I went back and my board thought, perhaps, I wonder, have we made a mistake here? Yes. <laughs> what was the first one that you read of his? Be was it Beauty Queen that yes. you did so wonderfully on Broadway? Yes, it was. And yeah. what, was it, what was it like to find a play that is now, I think, can, is considered, you know, a classic in the latter half of the 20th century for the first time as an actress? Do you, do you know you have something that you've yeah. not experienced before? When I read it, I knew. Mm. I, I knew it was something really great. I didn't know how it was going to emerge and if we were going to be able to do it, uh, the whole practicality of it. But I knew, just reading it, I knew it. Did I you know the part was yours when you read it? Did I? I think, I think, did, so. yeah. I, think I probably <laughs> did. I you probably don't have to did. audition for your old friend, I hope. No. Well, 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 well <laughs> it depends on suitability. Yeah. Sure, I'm not course, suitable yeah. for everything. Yeah. And, um, but but I think I think we did. Uh, Gary well, gave it to we, me and we, said, yeah. read this, and didn't say anything else. He usually says that, and then I'm saying, oh, my God. And I don't think there was a word changed in the whole script. No, I think it was more a matter of how do you do it. You know, I've, yeah. of, I've often said that if Martin actually brought Beauty Queen to a writer's workshop in Ireland at that yeah. time in the mid 90s, it, they would take one look at it. And I think this, in fact, was the reaction of some Irish theatres would have said, look, we, we don't write plays set in Irish kitchens with pictures of the crucifix or anything anymore. Um, well, would they feel that that was demeaning? Yes. They yeah. I mean, there's an argument in Ireland that, that basically, you know, and particularly when they look at the background, they, they will use an argument about Martin is that, that you know, it's not really Irish, it's pastiche, and Martin's well used to these kind of arguments. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like saying that somehow or other, if you're Irish, you have to be reverential towards mm -hmm. everything Irish, which is an incredibly old-fashioned idea. I mean, mm -hmm. that dates back to the time when, when Singh was excoriated for the fact that he choose to present Irishmen who weren't perfect in every yes, respect. Mm -hmm. It's very, very old. And we should say, to bring in the Cripple of the Minish Man, which is 
so wonderful Mark Donna play now, uh, you know, having had some Irish ancestry myself, I, I view that play with such, you know, it's so riveting because it really gives you a deep psychological truth about those people and, and, and the origin of a culture, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I think the, the thing, I mean, it deals with the whole issue of, of the, the loneliness, like, you know, both the kind of need for a society and yet the terrible sort of... Um, Isolation. Yeah. Well, when you're both isolated in it and you're too close to everybody. Right. And, and, and it's good, trying yeah. to mediate yeah. that kind of... And, and for those who haven't seen the play, it's about this young man who is crippled. He's crippled, crippled yeah. Who's raised by his aunts. Yes. Aunts, yes. Yeah. And he gets a chance to do a screen test. Martin takes a real incident, which was there was a Man of Iron, is a famous documentary of, of the early part of the century, right. which was made on Inishmore, the neighbouring of, of uh, Ireland to Inishman. And Martin takes that incident and then creates this extraordinary story mm -hmm. of this young crippled boy deciding that it was his one way out, out of the island right. and that he gets a screen test and gets brought to Hollywood. I mean, it's an extraordinary story. Yeah. And just the idea of the story itself is extraordinary, but then the skill with which Martin delivers that story up, it's, it's wonderful. But you see, though, in the sense of the isolation, the desire that the boy has to leave, you see in the character that you play, one of his aunts, they, you don't want him to leave the community, though, because you're lonely without him. It's just a part of you dies when somebody leaves. Mm -hmm. and, and Martin is extraordinary in, this, in the way he's written this because it's very sparse. There's no, there's no extra words. No. But you get a sense of the great love that these two... You're not quite sure if they're actually eccentric or if they're actually very real mm. aunts. Uh, the feelings they have for this boy. Mm -hmm. I mean, half the time they're insulting him and saying he'll never amount to anything, and the other half of the time they're missing him. I just love this play and I love Martin's writing because it gives us a sense of every aspect of our heads as people. Mm -hmm. You know, the good side of us and the bad side of us. And what audiences recognise is, you know, what, what we're like in a bad day. Mm -hmm. Those elements of our, and what we're like in good day, and how generous we can be, and how the other way we can be about things. And I think. He just brings everybody in, mm -hmm. and and so you do. He does let us have feel for these characters. Mm -hmm. and He's painting a picture of of the people, and then painting a picture of the, of the greater culture. I mean, for instance, bringing in of religion. It could be any culture. Yes, it right. doesn't have to be an Ishman. It could be any culture in Ireland. It could be any culture anywhere. But when we were doing Beauty Queen and when we were on Broadway, uh, we were asked at some point, and I happened to be around at the time, that the company who were about to give it its premiere in Iceland the actors would love to meet up after the show and so there we are there and there the four characters in Icelandic you know from Iceland walked in and they looked exactly like their four Irish counterparts on stage. But I think you're right Gary because this, these could be Muslim fundamentalists but I told you that I saw a production in, in Middle America a very prominent theater where they, they heightened the sociological uh, no they, they heightened the economic bracket of the characters yeah. in the beauty of Queen of land and, and it was just terrible because they 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 weren't deeply poor or needy or desperate yeah. and the play yeah. didn't work at all. Yeah, I think that's one of the things we would have. I mean, I think that's an element as well in the sense that uh, that's part of Martin's strength as a writer, like it was Sings. He right. is both part of the culture because his parents and mm -hmm. he spent much time there, but he's not. He's he's from London, and mm -hmm. it's that combination of both being within the culture and being able to stand outside mm -hmm. it that means, you know, the one question I asked when I saw read the play first: Who could have possibly written this play? Mm -hmm. I, uh, is this some person who lives in Kalamara who's hidden him under his bed for the last? 30 years, because I sort of absolutely knew that it wasn't a young Irish writer that wrote it. Hmm. In this production of The Cripple of Inishman, which premiered in New York at the Atlantic Theatre, where, yeah. where you also premiered Beauty Queen, uh, how many of the actors did you bring from Ireland? Basically what we did, I mean, it, Martin and I talked about it, about how we might set up this. Martin very much wanted that, if we were to do it again, that he wanted it to be a predominantly Irish company. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, we wanted it to be able to play in Ireland and to play also in New York. And you have certain union considerations. And we have yes. major union considerations and, you know, it's very, very difficult. So in this case, while we proposed equity, American equity and Irish equity, and, and, and both agreed, which was wonderful, which was was that of the 10 uh, equity members, 
including the stage manager, five are American equity and five are Irish equity. And the American equity uh, actors have uh, rehearsed and performed and toured the play in Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the Irish actors do the same over here. So it's a real sort of co-production, and you know we're, we're thrilled that American Equity, you know, have agreed to this. I think that what it's done is it's obviously delivered up work for both American Equity actors and Irish Equity actors, and it's also delivered up a really good uh, American. Irish co-production between Atlantic and Druid. The, the richness and the texture of the performances in a lot of the plays that I've seen you guys do, does it come from the fact that you have worked together for so long, that you really you know, are a family, that you can envision her in this part, or you can go to Gary and say, I'd love to try that? Do you think that the fact that you have, have been collaborators for so long gives you that extra depth in the productions that you do? Well, I, I suppose I suppose it does, but also we're from the west of Ireland. We're both from the west of Ireland, and I think when we started off, we we when we eventually we did sing in '75 and didn't feel that we'd done uh, a good job of it and wanted to go back to it. And I think that was a kind of an expression at that time. We we're in our twenties of. Um, something that belonged to the fact that we were both from the West of Ireland and the rest of the company as well at the time. So it was like answering something that didn't have a voice in Ireland at the time. I'm mm. not saying that everything was from well, Dublin. What does that mean to be from the West of Ireland? It's, it's just, it's just a di you have a different experience growing up there as opposed to living in Dublin. How so? Is it poorer? Is it's, it more it's remote? Not, is not it particularly poorer. It's yeah. more rural, I ah. think. Mm. Wouldn't you say that? And I think we, we noticed that there was a lot of... Um, stuff in maybe Sing and one or two, maybe John B, that we instinctively knew about from growing up. Not necessarily that we might have, we might have been those people. We had those people around us. Mm. This is a Catholic community, right? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, but is there is there a, a kind of class system in Ireland that there is in in Britain where you're made to feel? No, it's not so much. It's not so much a class system. It's just it's just a rural upbringing as opposed to a, a town upbringing. Mm -hmm. The West of Ireland would always have been regarded as the real Ireland, the the, the, the real Gaelic heart of Ireland beats in the West of Ireland, whereas mm. Dublin and the East Coast, which would have been more under the influence, of the, would have been the more colonised sort of mentality. And, you know, indeed, that with the founding of the Abbey, that, that sense, you know, for instance, that when the Singh was originally done in the Abbey, that Singh went out to the Iron Islands and brought back uh, clothes from the Iron Islands so the, the whole thing would be authentic. But I think that we would probably have felt in Ireland in the mid 70s that you know Galway is a very modern place to be. Oh, indeed, and I that don't that need kind of sense that. of of the sense of being young and being from the west of Ireland that that's really not being given a voice to, and I think that's what that's what Maria's I mean. Probably, we did. We had. You know, we felt it wasn't being given a voice. Yeah, and then the yeah, and then of course Martin comes along and gives it uh, well, even an even, even well, greater absolutely. voice. How could, well, how could we ever, you know, yeah. we, we had writers like Freel and particularly like Tom Murphy from Tom the West Murphy, of Ireland, yes, and then somebody fantastic. like, you know, uh, 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 Martin comes along. Right, one of the things I find fascinating about Martin's plays, and, and indeed about Singh's plays as well, um, is whenever a character comes on, they don't sort of come in and say exactly what they're going to do at first. They give you a story. Yeah. Everybody arrives on stage with a story about someone else in the village yeah. or an anecdote. Is this yeah. the way life is led in, 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 in these rural communities? Not no, I don't reality. think anybody has ever um, accused Martin of documentary realism. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that would be to severely underestimate his own great imagination. But, um, but certainly, I mean, I remember friends of mine, and these sort of English or American friends of mine, would always say about Irish people, they're very indirect. Why can't you say it straight out that, uh, that there's an elusive or an elliptical way of sort of going around and talking about mm. things? I think that's probably and true. Why is yeah, that? And why is that, do you think? I think it may be something, I mean, people say it's something to do with, first of all, that the, you know, English is an ad adopted language of mm -hmm. ours. And mm -hmm. second of all, it's about, it's about you know, uh, being colonized people, I yes. mean, which we were up to. 200 years ago yeah. and where there was a gap between the law of the country and the structure of the country and the actual people. I mean, you asked about a class system. There was, there was, there is a class system, the Irish and the English, mm -hmm. and that's still sort of there. And in the, I mean, in the real, you know, tense times, you couldn't always say what you, you really meant Absolutely. for fear of your no, life. No, I mean, something like the law, for instance, that's why something like a play like Playboy you know, where, where people will shelter a murderer yeah. from the law. It's yeah. because the law was regarded as not Irish, it right. was English. Now, when you guys finish up this run here, do you, you go back to Ireland? Uh, you work regularly in, at, at Druid? Yes, and other... I'm, I'm very lucky. I, 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 um, 
in the last, it's, it's, well, since we were here before, I, I get, I got to do the sing with a druid. I like to go back and do something if Gary has something that might suit. Mm -hmm. Be um, with your peeps, you say. Yes, yes. be with your peeps. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we're almost out of time. I want to say that this play is so successful that it's extended several times, and with any luck, you'll be playing it for a while. We hope so. We certainly enjoy playing it. Okay. Yeah, well, it's a terrific play, uh, wonderfully directed by Gary Hines. It's great to have Thank you, you back much. on Theatre Talk. Lovely and Marie theater. Mullen, who's so wonderful as a, as a caring, lovely aunt. But I don't know, there's something slightly sinister about those two women, I find. And just, they just want to keep that boy there. Yeah, keep they him do. down. Yeah, <laughs> I think they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Cripple of Inishman at the Atlantic Theatre Company. Don't miss it. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theatre Talk. Thank you very Thank much, you very indeed. Much. Great. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. <laughs> So, Michael, I read in your column recently that there is, of all things, a Michael Jackson musical coming to Broadway. Uh, yes, and uh, depending on how you feel about Michael Jackson, that's either a cause for celebration or cause for uh, total fear. Well, no, Michael uh, Jackson, is the, the, uh, the songwriter artist, was quite brilliant. Well, the, what's happened is that the Nederlanders, a big producing outfit here in New York, have acquired the rights to Thriller, which sold something like 750 million videos. One of the biggest sellers of Videos all time, yeah. and records and all that kind of stuff. Now, this is a 14-minute video. We all remember from the 80s, Thriller, you know, the zombie mm -hmm. or the guy's a zombie or werewolf, werewolf Oh, I can tell that's like one that. of your favorite yeah, videos. Yeah, on top of it. <laughs> yeah, he, he's in uh, the subway and there's packs of youth zombies. Is this right? Is this right, crew? Tell me. No. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell me. Yeah, he's not in the subway. They're, they're in a graveyard. Where, no. They're in a graveyard. Oh, in graveyard. <laughs> okay. So he's, he, he's in the graveyard of these zombies. So that, that and, he, and then in the end, he turns out to be a zombie himself. That's the kind of flip. <gasps> There's the, the ironic kicker. <laughs> What's interesting about this uh, is, first of all, that's only a 14 minute music video. Yes, yes. The Nederlanders simply have the rights to it. They have to now hire a book writer, uh, a director, a choreographer. They have to full, uh, flesh it all out. Michael Jackson has agreed to uh, write some more songs for it uh, if need be. He will be uh, involved in the creative process. See, as that's they call the one it. thing I wondered about was Michael Jackson involved in the creative process? Well, I think it's okay as long as the show is not Billy Elliot, let's say, where you have a lot of three boys dancing around. If it's an adult oh, show, I think, show. I, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, the larger issue, though, here is something that is interesting that the Niederlanders are doing. Uh, Jimmy Niederlander Jr., who is um, uh, the son of Mr. Niederlander Sr., mm -hmm. who founded mm -hmm. the whole company, uh, has before he got involved in the theater, he was very active in the rock world. He, he tended to that end of the family oh, business, really? the yeah. rock promotion concerts. So he has good relationships with a lot of iconic rock and pop figures we around the who? country. Well, for example, Jimmy Niederlander Jr. developed a show that I like very much called Moving Out. Yes, and Billy he Joel. developed that because of his relationship with Billy Joel. <laughs> and then he developed that. Well, I was gonna, that, that was a successful one. He also had a relationship with Bob Dylan, and they tried to develop the show uh, The Times They Are Changing, yes. which was a big bomb. Mm -hmm. The point, though, is that I think that Jimmy Niederlander Jr. has recognized that the, the music in the musical theater has got to now move on beyond South Pacific, Rodgers and Hammerstein. As much as we love those shows, there are grandmother shows. And the baby boomers of today, who, if they ever get their money back, will have money to spend on Broadway, want to hear the music of their time. And that is Billy Joel and Bob so Dylan he's betting and on Michael Jackson. Jukebox musicals. So he's, bet, he's betting on jukebox musicals. Although, in a way, Thriller is not a jukebox musical because it's going to follow the Thriller story. It's just expanding it out. It's an interesting attempt to try something new and different. And I guess, you know, most people do like that music video. I remember, I think as a kid, it was kind of scary and sort of fun. As a kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I was well, hip to those music. Yeah, when you were back in, in, in the past. Uh, now, here, 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 trivia question for you. Who was the, the voice of the narrator on the Thriller video? Oh, I don't know. Vincent Price. <gasps> That does, that does go back to your childhood. But now anyway, Michael, another thing you wrote about was yeah. that they're making a musical out of the Addams Family. That's one, that one is really in production. Yeah, that, will, that is opening in Chicago uh, in, in the fall and will be on Broadway a year from now. Um, Nathan Lane. Nathan Lane, B.B. Newworth, um, Jan Maxwell, Kevin Chamberlain, uh, Terrence Mann and Mary Louise Burke, I mean, a really first-rate great, great first Broadway cast, written by our friends uh, Rick Ellis and Marshall Brickman, who wrote Jersey Boys, two very, very funny guys. Yeah, they did. The only thing I wonder about that is the <clears throat> Adams Family, uh, as you know, I mean, that was from the 40s, the, the, the comic strip, then through the 60s, yeah. it was the TV show, yeah. sort of the horror family. And then a movie family. in the 90s. Yes, and it just seems very dated. I mean, I would think now you would want to have more like My Bloody Valentine, the musical, something more I don't think hip we're quite, about horror. Right, well, I don't think we're quite there yet, and I don't think it's, it's not 
going to be a horror musical. It's a musical comedy. Yes. That's what well, it is. And that's why we have Nathan Lane, our greatest <clears throat> comic actor, don't you think? Indeed, indeed. Uh, what's interesting about this is that the Charles Adams estate is really running this show. I mean, they, ah. they control the rights, of course, to all these characters, the, the, the drawings. And they uh, are a very strong estate, and they're overseeing every aspect of this production. And they insisted from the beginning that this musical not be based on the TV show and not based on the popular movie franchise of the 90s, but it be a completely original story based solely on the sketches and the drawings and the scenes in Charles Adams. Uh, it will not use storylines from the movies or from... Or from uh, the TV show. It's original uh, to the stage and it's been updated. So the Adams family now live in New York in 2009 and they live in a spooky castle in Central Park. Oh, so we shall okay. see. We'll see. My right. only hesitation there is uh, the score is by Andrew Lippa, who is an accomplished musician, but he's one of these new breed of composers who Doesn't are very, <laughs> very skillful, but can't write any tunes. <laughs> right. And as somebody pointed out to me, who went to this recent reading and liked it, they thought it was very funny and they love the cast. And they said, but you know, you really think. You gotta have a tune that's at least as catchy as da 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 dum. Yeah. Because without that, if you go into the, if you go see the Adams Family musical, and that tune will not be used. But if you go to see it and you leave it and you're humming da 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 dum.